today, we will talk about VFR navigation charts. The second part, since we divided this topic into two videos. In the first video, we discussed some basic definitions and the different types of VFR charts. In this second part, we will look at the different symbols and graphic representations that we can find in a typical VFR chart. So without any further ado, let's get into it. As we said in the previous video, a map or chart will graphically represent the relevant features of an area depending on its purpose. For example, nautical charts will focus on aspects relevant to maritime navigation, such as water depth, obstacles to maritime navigation, location and characteristics of lighthouses and buoys, etc. While on the other hand, a road map for example, will focus on other aspects that are relevant for drivers, such as highway and streets nomenclature, towns along a highway, gas stations, etc. So, in the same way, a VFR chart will focus on displaying information relevant to air navigation. In general terms, any VFR chart will have a grid of parallels and meridians. It will show the relief and terrain characteristics. Cities and towns. Main highways, secondary roads, and railroads. Obstacles relevant to air navigation. Civil and military aerodromes. Isogonic and agonic lines of magnetic variation. Radio navigation aids such as VORs and NDBs. Airspace structures and classification, as well as restricted, prohibited, and dangerous zones. With this in mind, let's look at each of these elements in more detail, starting with the grid of parallels and meridians. This corresponds to the representation of the meridians and parallels passing over the place being mapped, as we can see in this example with these black lines. They are useful for locating points using geographic coordinates, and they are also used to determine the true course of a route using a plotter. Then, we have the terrain relief, which corresponds to the graphic representation of the irregularities of the terrain and features such as mountains, hills, valleys, plateaus, and plains. Here, since we are trying to represent 3D figures on a flat surface, color gradients are used, which means that for each elevation range above sea level, a particular color is used, as we can see in this example. Here we have the colors typically used in operational navigation charts. And here in these other images, we can see some examples of how they are used in a chart to represent mountainous terrain. Now, it is important to mention that some charts may use different colors to represent different elevation ranges. In this sectional chart for example, the color gradients used are different from those of the operational charts that we just saw. This way, it is important to verify this information in the legend of the chart in order to properly interpret the terrain relief in a certain area. Now, another way to represent terrain features on a chart is by using contour lines. These are lines that join points of equal elevation and they are used mainly in mountainous areas. In this example, we can see that each contour line is accompanied by its corresponding elevation above sea level. And in this image we can also appreciate how a 3D figure is converted into a 2D representation on a chart. Now, to correctly interpret the contour lines on a chart, we must keep in mind that if the lines are close together, they represent a rapid change in elevation, as we can see in the image on the left. While if the lines are spaced apart, they represent a gradual change in elevation, and therefore a more gentle slope. On VFR charts, contour lines are usually drawn every 1,000 feet, as we can see in this example. However, in some areas, contour lines can be drawn every 500 feet, it all depends on the type of chart and its scale. In this case, on charts where an interval other than 1,000 feet is used between contour lines, this information will be included in the chart legend, as we can see in this example of a sectional chart, where the contour lines are drawn every 500 feet and intermediate contours every 250 feet. Now, another way to warn pilots about high terrain is by means of elevation points distributed along the chart. These are points that have a particular elevation above sea level, and they are usually placed on the peaks of hills or mountains, 
to warn pilots flying in the area. In this case, if there is a black dot, it means that at that point, the elevation is exactly the one indicated on the chart. While if there is a black cross, it means that at the marked point, the exact elevation is uncertain, but is believed to be the value indicated on the chart. In these two images we can see some examples of elevation points on a sectional chart. And in these other examples, where terrain data is not accurate, approximate elevations are used. So with all this, the use of contour lines, gradient colors, and elevation points provide the pilot with fairly accurate and detailed terrain relief information, which is essential for flight planning. VFR charts also depict features that can be used as visual reference for navigation, such as water bodies, like rivers, lakes, dams, reservoirs, and oceans, which are represented with their actual shape and name in blue. Here we can see some examples of them. In the same way, cities, towns, and villages are also included on the chart, since they are commonly used as visual reference for navigation. In this case, big cities are represented with their actual shape in yellow. Smaller cities are represented by yellow squares. Towns and villages are represented by small squares or circles with no background color. And in addition to this, any other relevant man-made structures or landmarks are represented by black dots or squares. Here are some examples of this, both in operational and sectional charts. Now, another important feature to be depicted on a VFR chart are highways, roads, and railroads. Normally, primary roads or highways are represented by thick dark red or gray lines, depending on the type of chart. While secondary roads are represented by thin dark red or gray lines. Railroads are represented by black lines with small transverse lines, one or two, depending on the number of tracks. For example, in this operational navigation chart we can see that dark red is used for primary and secondary roads, and there is also a single-track railroad. While in this sectional chart, we can see that gray is used to represent the roads, and we can see both single- and dual-track railroads. Now, other important information for pilots, especially when flying at low altitude, is the position of power lines and pylons, since these can be very tall and not easily visible from the cockpit. This way, high voltage lines are represented by dashed lines and black dots that represent the pylons. However, in some charts, they can be represented with continuous black lines between drawn pylons. Here we can see an example of how power lines are represented in an operational chart. While in this other image, we can see how power lines are represented in a sectional chart. Now, apart from power lines and pylons, there are other objects or landmarks that are considered to be obstacles to air navigation. In these cases, obstacles with a height of less than 1,000 feet above ground level are represented by a blue triangle with a dot. And if there is more than one obstacle in the same place, they will be represented by two overlapped blue triangles with two dots as we can see in this example. On the other hand, if the obstacles are higher than 1,000 feet above ground level, then they are represented by triangles with an extension at the top, as we can see here. In some charts, we can find some other variants, such as this one, which is used for obstacles with high-intensity lighting, and this other one specifically for wind turbines. In all cases, the obstacles will be accompanied by two numbers. The first one represents the elevation above sea level, while the one between parentheses is the height of the obstacle above ground level. Here we can see some examples of obstacles in a sectional chart. Also, in some charts, for each grid of parallels and meridians, a maximum elevation figure is published with three digits. The maximum elevation figure is the highest point within a grid. In this particular example, within the grid, the highest point of the terrain and obstacles is 12,500 feet above sea level. 
Here we can see an operational navigation chart with their corresponding maximum elevation figures. Now, one of the most important elements in a navigation charts are the aerodromes. Here, depending on the type of chart, different symbols and criteria can be used to depict aerodromes. For example, here we have the symbology used in operational navigation charts. In this case, each aerodrome is accompanied by its name and elevation above sea level. And in some cases, when the runway is not represented, the first two digits of the runway length in feet are included, as we can see here. Here we can see an operational navigation chart and how different aerodromes are depicted. However, other type of charts such as the ones developed by the FAA may have different criteria for depicting aerodromes, including more detailed information about them, as we can see in this chart legend. Another important element for navigation is the value of the magnetic variation in a certain area. For this, the chart depicts the isogonic and agonic lines of magnetic variation with dashed lines. Here we can see some examples of how we can find these lines on a chart. Now, although VFR navigation is not entirely based on the use of radio navades, they can certainly be used as a reference to verify the position of the aircraft. So the charts also show navades such as VORs, DMEs, Vortex and NDBs, with their corresponding names, frequencies, and any other additional information. Here we can see some examples of how they are depicted. Another element that we can find in a VFR navigation chart are restricted, prohibited, dangerous, and special use airspaces, which are depicted with their actual shapes and sometimes specifying their vertical limits. Here we can see some examples of these airspaces. Apart from these, some charts also include other airspace structures, such as terminal areas and control zones with their corresponding vertical limits and airspace classification. However, some charts may have different criteria to depict these airspaces and sometimes include more information, as we can see in this example with the FAA criteria. Here we can see some examples of these airspace structures. Now, although most VFR charts do not include IFR routes and airways, some of them do, such as those developed by the FAA, as we can see in this chart legend. And here we can see an example of how they are depicted in the charts. I hope the information presented in this video was useful. If so, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching.